We're ready for our last two presentations. We're going to have Cisco Systems up first, followed by AT&T. And I'm just going to remind you at this point, we have a very hard stop at 5 p.m. today because of other needs for this room. So I'm going to be uh, closely moderating it towards the end to make sure we get out of here in time. Um, with that, let me start with introducing Annie Murphy from uh, Cisco. She's a security consulting systems engineer. Uh, she first joined Cisco in 1996 and has had various roles with software development, marketing, and sales. The last nine years, she's focused on security. She has published white papers on DOCSIS, Baseline Privacy for Cable Network Security. Mm, I think I need to talk to you about our campus after this. <laughs> and has spoken at various conferences regarding security. Annie holds a bachelor degree in computer science as well as an MBA from Santa Clara University. So that's an, I'm in Santa Cruz. That's another reason why to have you come out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> in any event, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to get right into it and understand why we're talking about security even 10 years later. A lot of the same fundamentals hold true. It just seems to resonate with people a lot more these days because of the explosive growth in connected devices. Uh, what we're saying right now is about 15 billion devices in the universe that we have connected. In, ne in the next four to five years, we expect that to go up to 50 billion. And then by the year 2030, we estimate about 500 billion. So if you think about how many connected devices you have on your person today, you probably have a smartphone, you probably have a laptop, maybe at home you have a cable modem that actually is servicing several devices in your home that aren't just for internet maybe you're actually streaming video maybe you're streaming radio and pretty soon we'll have refrigerators and toasters and thermostats and fire detectors your dog your grandma uh, the idea is is that all of those devices when they are connected become part of what we call the attack surface and so beyond just saying, OK, before I'm only worried about my one email inbox, nowadays most people have more than one email address, which means they have one more, more than one inbox, which means they have more than one place or more vector that can be compromised. And so now more than ever, security has become more commonplace as a kind of everyday conversation topic than a more pedestrian topic that we talk about. It's not, no longer relegated to just IT. It's not relegated to just someone who is very caring about just the cyber infrastructure. It's everybody, all consumers. The dynamic threat landscape. Because the attack surface has grown exponentially, what we're seeing is that basically every single agency, corporation, department has had some exposure. The really scary thing about this exposure is that most of these exposures went undetected living inside the network for a period of almost a year in most cases. So in that period of time, the exfiltration of possible private records, critical information can happen in just a few short hours even though the exposure was for almost 100 to 200 days. We have to think about how we're going to protect ourselves from this. But it's so easy because the, the attackers only have to be right one time, and we, from a protection point of view, have to be right every single time. So let's just kind of talk about the anatomy of how some of these things happen. We'll talk about a spam campaign. And this is a very targeted attack that happens with, say, you're an HR recruiter, and someone says, please open this email. My resume is attached. It seems very innocuous, but this is how else are we going to be able to relegate this? This is something that is still very commonplace. This is something that we do every day. And basically, the user gets an email, and they're baited into not just opening the email, but also opening the attachment. 
In some cases, the attachment's not even physically attached to the email. Sometimes it is a redirection URL that takes them to a compromised server. And at that point, there is an expo there's an exposure point where they can make contact with the command and control server and either data is exfiltrated or some type of malicious files are placed onto the host computer which lies dormant waiting to make a connection with the command and control server. In the case of ransomware, in this case CryptoWall 3, the, the payload gets exfiltrated out to a command and control server. The command and control servers then encrypts the data and holds the data ransom and basically says, please deposit $15,000 into this Bitcoin address if you, want the if you want to actually decipher the key to get your data back. So ransomware is a very commonplace thing. I think the most recent uh, one that hit the newswire was Hollywood Pres Presbyterian. Uh, they went ahead and paid the $17,000 in ransom as opposed to how much money it was going to cost them to actually try to comb through figuring out where the breach occurred. Uh, this is becoming more and more a reality, and in most cases, a lot of these attacks are used once. So even if you figure out how to defeat this one particular custom piece of malware, it doesn't matter because it will change and it will polymorph itself to be something different in another person's environment. And in most cases, people think of themselves as, well, I'm not, I'm not a hospital, I'm not a justice department, I'm not holding any major keys to the castle. But the reality is, is that anyone can be exposed or be used as a point of exposure so that they can then pivot and get to another high value target. Typically, uh, legacy security was what we considered what we call perimeter security, the idea of a fortress where I have some type of a treasure that's inside my stronghold and I build a wall around it. And in that case, I poke holes into that wall for sanctioned data. Well, this worked when those data paths were statically mapped. But nowadays, we know that we have more and more services that use a dynamic set of ports. And even if I sanction those ports for very specific applications, the applications themselves can still mask something that can be hidden in that particular pathway. So for instance, if I want to have Outlook 365 go, I have to go out to the cloud. I have to actually have something open to get to Outlook 365. I have to have something open so I can actually speak Skype. Whatever is actually also negotiating over those ports could ne they might not necessarily be sanctioned. And even if they are detected as being malicious, you can't just close up the port for everyone. And so we have to think about how are we going to take a look at what's going on during, before, during, and after a session is opened, when someone actually connects to the internet, when someone actually closes up the session, and what we can do about that. This is just looking at the evolution of security. A lot of the times people will talk about here, you know, we just install antivirus if I just put an IPS, if I just stick a sniffer here, if I just firewall everything. The reality is, is that a defense in depth approach is still needed. The reality is I don't have a, a single pass or a single pane of glass that can just protect everything. And therefore, how am I going to be able to have a very thoughtful approach around how I want to protect my security? So first, we're going to just talk about the strategy around how you can think about protecting your data. So first is just breach prevention. So this is the hardening of our systems. This is the low-hanging fruit. This is the, I'm still going to go get my vaccines done so I don't get infected. So these are the things that we can do to protect ourselves from what we do know is out there. And so this is the systematic patching that we still do. This is just making sure that people understand I shouldn't actually click on URLs that I don't understand, that I don't look that they don't look familiar to me. I shouldn't accept emails from unknown email addresses. 
And sometimes that's not necessarily something that is digitally placed on the host. Sometimes it's education programs that we can do for our users. Sometimes this can actually be training. The idea is that that's the first line, is just what can we do to harden ourselves to begin with. The second, the second phase is understanding how quickly can we detect once something has been breached. How do I shorten that amount of time, which is somewhere between 100 to 200 days, how do I shorten that window down so that it's just within hours or maybe just a few days or less than a week so that I can immediately address that? Because if I don't see it and I don't detect it, obviously I can't address it, I can't control it, I can't remediate that. So this is the idea of how many security cameras do I have? How many sniffers do I have? How many sensors do I have to detect when something malicious is happening? And then how do I remediate that? So an analogy that I use often to describe this process is credit monitoring. All of us have gone through the process of possibly trying to buy a house or trying to buy a car. A lot of that is is dependent on what your credit score is. And so sometimes it's not until you actually try to open a credit card that you realize that your identity has been stolen. And so nowadays there's actually free services out there that allow you to monitor your credit report. And as Americans, we are entitled to a free credit report every year. Well, that's great. So I make sure that I pay my credit card bill on time every day. So I am doing my best to be due diligent in terms of making sure that I have good credit financial hygiene. And then I have a monitoring system in place that will send me an email if some new account is opened in my name, if some new information has been added to my credit report. The problem is when something happens, so if there's an Annie Murphy that suddenly shows up in Georgia that now has an account that's gone into collections and it hits my credit report, the reporting agency does nothing to try to remediate that. The remediation, unfortunately, is on me, the users. And in most cases, that's actually where all of the heavy lifting takes place is once the breach or once the detection or once the exposure has occurred. And so the same thing happens to your network infrastructure is that once something is detected, the amount of time, energy, and cost associated with trying to remediate a host's system once it's already been exposed is almost so painful that most people can relate to why Hollywood Presbyterian went ahead and just paid the ransomware. So we talk about the attack continuum. The idea is making sure that we have security capabilities that address before an attack occurs, during, so that's the detection piece, as well as the after. What am I doing to be able to remediate after the fact that I've already been compromised? The first step is visibility. I can't control what I can't see. The idea is where is this attack coming from? Where are my attack vectors? And trying to narrow that attack surface as much as possible. If I'm allowing wireless devices on my network, what kinds of wireless devices am I allowing on the network? If I'm allowing sanctioned staff members on there and it's only particular AD groups, I should probably have a different policy set up for someone who's joining via their own smartphone versus probably a wired desktop. And I also want to have a way to be able to differentiate between someone who's logging in as themselves truly versus someone who has compromised credentials. And that means in order for me to have that level of context, I should have some level of intelligence that's sitting behind my network infrastructure informing me of any changes in the network. Maybe an IP address has changed. Maybe a MAC address has changed. Maybe a MAC address and an IP address and the username has changed, all associated with a particular port. When a session connection occurs, when I initiate that particular setup, 
I want to record it so there is an accounting of what's going on. This gives me visibility into what has occurred. And so in the case of me downloading a file that has not yet had the chance to expose itself as being infected or malicious, it probably is considered a clean file because it hasn't done anything yet. But once that file decides to wake up, phone home, make it to the command and control server, I need to record that and be able to say, okay, take a fingerprint of this particular malicious piece of file or malicious uh, piece of malware and now record that disposition so that I can either send it off and make sure that everyone else on my network is now blocking this particular file or I can keep it for further forensics, whether I have a group within my own organization that does that. So we have context, we need enforcement, and then we're also doing some type of continuous analysis because a file that was good yesterday can be bad tomorrow because it hasn't had a chance to wake up yet. It's waiting, it's baiting its time. Uh, one of the big kind of high profile events that happened recently in the Bay Area was Super Bowl. It wasn't just the Super Bowl, it was Super Bowl 50. Super Bowl 50 in Silicon Valley. From a security point of view, we were concerned about all kinds of traffic, whether it was SMS text messages, whether it was anything that was on the Jumbotron, we had so many different areas. We had at least a million new visitors to every single one of our public areas a day during Super Bowl week. And the idea is, is understanding, how do I know what's going to be carried in that's customized specifically for this particular event, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a school, whether it's the stadium. Those are all different types of vectors that should be keenly aware of what's going on. So let's look at another use case in terms of being able to provide visibility and control and thinking about that before, during, and after. Before someone comes onto a campus, what do I know about this person? What kind of information can I capture from this person? Before I actually allow them onto the network, I need them to give me their cell phone number. And the only way I can do that is to tell them, I'll let you onto the network as long as I can text you your key. So we do that here to get our, our guest passwords here within the UC Davis Campus Center, the conference center. They give, us, they give us a key that temporarily works for wireless LAN for the next two hours that I'm on, on site on campus. But they also now have my cell phone number. So if I do anything malicious during that session, I know exactly what IP address, what MAC address, and everything that's associated with Annie Murphy, and I can call her. We also want to set roles based on that information, so I know the difference between an iOS device versus a Mac OS device versus a Windows device versus an Android device or Chrome OS. And then based on that information, I'm going to limit which resources I'm going to get connected to. And that sounds well and good when we talk about wireless. Well, why are we going to stop there with wireless? Why don't we extend that to the entire network? And so once what was part of the problem, where we talk about this gigantic attack surface, anything that gets connected online, why don't we make it part of the solution? Because every single one of those devices has the capability of tagging the traffic as it traverses that particular gateway, whether it's a switch, whether it's a router, whether it's a wireless controller, whether it's a firewall, of course, if it's a firewall, of course, if it's a sniffer. The reality is I don't have unlimited budget where I can stick a sniffer on every single port. But if there is a port there, I can at least get NetFlow information from that record. So NetFlow information, for those that don't understand what NetFlow is, is basically like a phone bill. It doesn't tell me what the actual content of the phone call was, but it'll actually give me pretty useful information about how long the call was, who the call was initiated from, who the call was going to, and in the NetFlow case, I can actually look at which ports were being used, and from there I could probably extrapolate what applications were being used. 
And over time, with all of that information, all of those NetFlow records, I can build baselines. I can look at trends. I can look at entire profiles of someone that's sitting on a particular floor of a building or particular groups. I can differentiate between my DNS server's traffic versus my user's desktop traffic. And then based on just trends, I can actually zero in on or hone in on anything that looks anomalous. And NetFlow records are very, very cheap to store. You can have months, years worth of traffic stored in very little space because I'm not storing the entire packet capture, just the NetFlow records. So at Cisco, we call this network as a sensor, but we also have this concept of network as an enforcement point. So remember when I talked about the credit monitoring where I'm saying, okay, now I'm detecting, but I'm doing nothing to remediate that? Well, if you are the point of entry and you can detect that something is happening that's not normal, it's outside the bounds of what I consider a baseline trend. If I have a point of sale host trying to talk to my HVAC system, stop that. We can immediately enforce a particular policy associated around that particular group. So we can have groups set up that we can say, you know what, if this, uh, if this particular host has traffic that fits outside of the norms, let's go ahead and just drop that traffic. We can either black hole that traffic, we can firewall that traffic, depending on what device is sitting there. Let's create a dynamic policy that just says, hey, you know what, I'm gonna police myself. This is something that's rather unusual. On the service provider side, traditionally, when we actually add on any kind of security policies within our service provider side, it looks something like this. First, we have to decrypt it. Then we have to make sure from a flow control perspective that it's not DDoS. Then we apply our firewall policies, web application firewall policies, make sure it's not matching against any signatures, and then I'll go ahead and allow or drop the traffic. And this isn't through anyone's particular fault. The reality is it's because just like that first slide I showed in terms of how we grew, there's no silver bullet. As we learned more about different types of security attacks, we would tack on other types of protection me mechanisms. And it became this manual process. So now we're looking at different types of inspection engines that will allow us to fast path certain types of traffic, or we can actually add more layers of inspection through a single pass engine. Again, the same way as we route packets based on source and destination, we can actually tag packets in terms of what should be inspected with the, with the associated with, uh, inspection engine. So in this case, we see here with the different meta tags. So we call this intelligent service stitching. And then based on that, we can build dynamic tags, we can build dynamic policies and dynamic flow paths. And the idea is as we add, because we don't know what the next level of security is gonna be tomorrow or 10 years from now, but we have to have a platform that allows us to be able to flexibly look at all of these different pieces of traffic before, during, and after attacks occurred. So I have only one Cisco slide in here, uh, but we do have our next generation firewall platforms that are capable of doing the, int uh, the intelligence service stitching, which is the Firepower 4100 and the 9300. We've now introduced Firepower Threat Defense on all the ASA 5500X platforms, as well as the 5585X. And so in conclusion, we just wanna talk about a comprehensive security approach with your peers. The idea is making sure that I look at all of the capabilities of my security posture before, during, and after. I think a lot of us have done a really good job of the before, making sure that we're hardening our systems and really looking at that perimeter. But what more can we do in terms of detection as well as remediation? 
Unfortunately, we're spending more time and money on the remediation than we should be if we could actually think about that and be more thoughtful about how we deploy our security ahead of time. So I have about five minutes if we want to open it up to Q&A. Five minutes. I have Kobe Kumasaka and Konstantin Grigorov, who are your Cisco account team for the UCs as well as Scenic. <laughs> We have any questions? We have one question back here. We'll wait for the microphone. Yeah, I was wondering what kind of reputation service Cisco, Cisco still maintains. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, on the back end, all of our systems do tie to a security intelligence cloud. We call it Talos, and it's the culmination of sender base that we got from the Ironport acquisition, which is really kind of the original reputation filter. Um, sender base basically looks at one out of every three packets of email that traverses the world. That includes the 90% of email that you never open because it's spam. Um, so we can have a pretty accurate idea of the IP address of a sender, uh, whether or not it's considered legitimate or not. On top of that, we also acquired SourceFire a little over three years ago. With that, we also acquired VRT, which is the vulnerability research team. So uh, that those who don't know what SourceFire does, they are the people who invented Snort, which is the most widely deployed IPS engine out there. Uh, so between VRT, sender base and the security intelligence office of operations within Cisco, we have about 500 dedicated uh, engineers who are just threat hunting every day. We block about 19 billion attacks a day. Uh, our footprint's pretty large. Uh, we basically consume about uh, anywhere between 10 to 11 billion different types of artifacts daily. Uh, just in terms of scale, uh, usually the, the, the scale that we usually use is that Google's daily search lookups are somewhere between three to four and a half billion lookups a day, and we're, we're consuming about anywhere between nine to 11 billion artifacts a day that we're using for our, our footprint. So our, our cloud for the intelligence, which is Talos, and we do have a blog, uh, is, is pretty substantial. Um, so that's what we're using for our reputation filtering. Any other questions? Great. I'll, I'll wrap up so we can transition for AT&T to get up here. Thank you. <laughs>